Thank you so much. And uh, I'm very glad to be with each of you. This is a very important time for us to all come together. And uh, I know we're all facing many problems, many issues. Today was a particularly uh, profound and moving day with the uh, funeral of, of uh, George Floyd. And uh, I know that uh, we're all facing uh, uh, multiple crises all at the same time. We had a, uh, have a pandemic, a pandemic which continues. Uh, we have an economic crisis, a mental health crisis. Uh, now there's a political crisis. And, all of us are feeling very uncertain at this time. We all have a sense that uh, all is not well with the world, even though in many ways, I think things are starting to move uh, in a better direction. And we'll talk about that, but what better way for us to grapple with the issues that we all face than to come together for this kind of a conversation today, uh, on this particular day, and with one of the experts in the field. Many of you I know have personal issues and questions, all of us do. And uh, on behalf of Jewish Family and Children's Services, one of our major areas of service is, as uh, some of you know, services to children and families. And uh, we have a center for, the, uh, for, for children and youth, which uh, is available to each of you. If, with, if you have specific questions at the end of this time together, we're gonna to put up on the screen a number for you to call. You should feel free to call with your individual questions. We have experts available to answer all of your questions and we hope that you'll call. Today we will um, hear from, um, from um, Madeline who uh, many of you know is an expert in the field. Uh, I've, known, I've known Madeline for uh, probably 40 years. We started together at Jewish Family and Children's Services when Madeline was a beginning clinician. She worked as a therapist at Jewish Family and Children's Services and she was always one of our stars. And that was many years ago. She's gone on to become a world renowned psychologist, a, um, a educator and uh, the founder of a, of a major force uh, having to do with raising children and what it means to be successful as a person and how to raise successful children, a new definition of success at, at Stanford University called Challenge Success. And she's written many books. As a matter of fact, I always remember once when I was at the airport at San Francisco and I was buying a book before getting on the airplane and the person in front of me was buying Price of Privilege, which was your book, Madeline. And then the person behind me was also buying your book. <laughs> uh, so no wonder it's a New York Times bestseller, but the book that you have now, which uh, I wanna highlight, is, is called Ready or Not. And here's a copy of the book. And at the end, when we also put up the phone number for you to call with your personal questions, we'll also show you where to get the book. You can get it, I'm sure, on Amazon. But it says, preparing our kids to thrive in an uncertain and rapidly changing world. Well, what could be uh, more uncertain and rapidly changing than the situation we're facing right now, the unprecedented situation we're facing right now? So I'll ask Madeline a few questions and ask you to talk uh, about your book and about uh, what you're seeing in your practice, because you see uh, the internal workings of many families as we do at Jewish Family and Children's Services. We see the inner workings of many families. We know that there are no families that don't have problems. We, there are no, fam no individuals uh, who don't have problems. Know that you know that very well uh, also. So we'll spend some time with you talking about why you wrote the book and um, some of the big issues that families and parents are facing right now and then we'll open it up uh, after about a half an hour for questions from our audience. So Madeline, what a I, pleasure to see you. We're really delighted that you are spending time with us tonight. Thank you, Anita. And it's actually 41 years. 41, <laughs> what was coming? Time. Yeah. Long time. Yeah. We were both, we were both babies when we started. Um, I, got, yeah. I feel like a Jewish family and children's service trained me. So thank you. So Madeline, tell us a little bit about how you found your way to writing this particular book on this particular topic right now and, uh, and how you see this as especially relevant to parents who are coming to you now every day, I know all day for consultation and guidance. Uh, so I, I did not know there was gonna be a pandemic, that's for sure. I started writing that book five years ago. Um, and it came out the week before lockdown. The, the idea that there was a great deal of uncertainty in the world was increasingly obvious in the military, in business, uh, not so much in our ideas about parenting or in our ideas about education. So I got interested in 
that. I got interested in how come everybody else knows like things are uncertain, but we're not acting on it. But I also got very interested in the fact that uh, the price of privilege, which you mentioned, was written 15 years ago. And at that time, rates of anxiety and depression were escalating. There's been a cadre of us running around the country talking about how kids need more sleep and less emphasis on performance and um, more downtime. And, and in spite of, I've spoken at almost 300 schools, and in spite of that, and in spite of a lot of parents shaking their head in agreement, uh, things really hadn't changed very much. And if they had changed, they had changed negatively because rates of anxiety, which is now the number one uh, diagnosis, both for kids and adults, by the way, so their parents, as children and their parents, um, about one in three are suffering from an anxiety disorder. Um, like, what was that about? Why was it getting worse? So many people were sort of giving the other side of the story, challenge success was giving the other side of the story, and yet um, kids seemed more vulnerable, less resilient, and certainly more anxious. And that's those two things, the uncertainty and the heightened rates of anxiety were the things that provoked me, promoted to, to promote more ideas about what was going on. One of the themes about anxiety and dealing with uncertainty is a question that many parents have. How do you deal with frightening news and, and the difficult situation that we face in this world now with your children? Right. How do you deal with uh, successfully with stress? Because uh, people are grappling, parents are grappling with uh, how, to, how to deal with all this frightening news uh, uh, and, and, and talk to their children. So, you know, my disclaimer always is uh, every child is different and every family is different. And so I will say what I think. Um, I will say what we know about groups of kids. And you have to hear that as um, an, an idea, but it may or may not be applicable to your family because kids are different. Young kids, um, that would be kids under about six, live in a world of magic, right? They believe in the Easter bunny and what, whatever. They have magical thinking. And so long explanations about how we can't see grandma because she's at a high risk group and she has asthma and she might have, you know, no, that, that's not helpful for a young child. I, th I always think less is more with young children. Uh, they will ask you questions and, and respond in a way they understand, which is short and concrete and specific. After about age seven, or starting at age seven, kids learn to think um, logically. And so they can sort of go from A to B. They're curious. It's a great opportunity, I think, to do some uh, media literacy training. You want to start by asking them what they know, and they will come back with some amazing things, like we're all going to die. Um, and, that, and that's always a good starting place is to listen first. And then for kids that age, you can start looking about where did you hear that and how do you know that that's true and um, teaching them how to evaluate. Now, not so much a seven-year-old, but certainly an 11-year-old can start to think about evaluating the information they have. Now, it's going to be um, disturbing, uh, and, and there's no way around that. Um, let me talk about that in a minute. Let me just get to the last kind of age group, which is adolescents who are having a hell of a time right now because they've been dropped in the deep end of the disappointment pool. Um, but, they, but on the other hand, they are capable of not only logical thinking, but abstract thinking. Uh, you can talk to them more or less like um, an older person, uh, a friend or something, bearing in mind that they are living in a part of their brain that's very emotionally driven as opposed to prefrontal, which is more what we call executive functioning, you know, thinking about things and those kinds of things. So with all those age groups, I think you start by asking kids what they know and what they want to talk about. And then you um, make it in a language that kids can understand. 
my point was that it's going to be upsetting because it's an incredibly upsetting time. Um, and one of the things that came up a lot when I was writing Ready or Not was this idea that kids were becoming less resilient. And I thought that they were becoming less resilient because they were being overprotected in the wrong ways and underprotected in the ways I thought they should be. So parents were very concerned about their grades, but not so concerned about um, allowing them to have slightly anxiety provoking situations, which they could master, whether it was walking past a dog or whatever. And I think we're seeing more of that now. We're seeing this kind of lack of resilience because these kids have not had opportunities to experience disappointment little by little. I think I had told you the story, Anita, of uh, giving a talk and asking how many people had never had their heart broken uh, up at uh, Hamlin's. And um, only one person out of 500 never had their heart broken. Well, the rest of us survived. Everybody survived having their heart broken because in life, you get to have small episodes of disappointment. You don't get invited to the popular girl party, or you're not on the select team, or you're not varsity. And those build up a kind of muscle for resilience. Um, but if your mother is like making a cooler party for you so you don't have to be disappointed, or if you talk to the coach and make a donation so you get your kid on the team, all of those take away from a kid's capacity to tolerate disappointment. And so I think one of the things that parents are dealing with is like how much protection do kids need during this period of time? And um, what I had spoken to you earlier, I said parents are overestimating the damage they're doing by like, you know, forgetting about the schedule for a day, which I think is incidental. And they're underestimating that most everything about how their kid responds has to do with their own response, with their ability to maintain a calm, stable, loving environment in the midst of all this difficulty. That was long-winded, sorry. <laughs> no, okay. so, uh, talk a little bit more about what you're seeing uh, in, uh, in terms of the pr your practice and the kinds of problems that are coming to you now. What are parents doing that uh, they might do better or that are creating problems or uh, in terms of how they deal and how we as parents are dealing with uh, some of the issues that we're facing with our kids. So, you know, people like tips, right? We all like tips because they're concrete and they help us. So parents have gotten all kinds of tips about putting a schedule up and making sure that you stay to the schedule and nobody's actually doing that or nobody who calls me is actually doing that. So parents are really concerned about the fallout. What if I, you know, today my kid didn't get up till whatever, 11. And I would urge parents to be uh, relatively indifferent, relatively indifferent to these kinds of lapses. They're not gonna matter much. I think you have to think about what's the goal of getting through this. Um, where do you want to be when we come out, however we come out the other end? And I would suggest that the goal is to have a reasonably intact family at the end of this. And so if your kid gets up at, I had a mother today, uh, my kid's supposed to get up at 8.30 and I hear the kids screaming in the background, um, I'm not getting out of bed, I'm not getting out of bed. And it's like, drop it just drop it because in the overall scheme of things, one of the things you want to do in a period of great stress is not to add to your stress, right? It doesn't do any good. You're overloaded anyway with, with hormones. You want to bring your stress down. So if school's supposed to start at 830 and your kid says, I'm not getting up till nine, school now starts at nine o'clock. Um, you pick your battles. Uh, and I'm not saying your kid gets to do whatever they want, but man, you need a big dose of flexibility in with structure. So, you know, that's one of the things I think would be helpful for parents. No parents. So today, you know, you and I talked earlier, I was on the phone the entire day. Every phone call was about 
a child, everyone. My child's crying, my child's this, my child's that. And I'm concerned about those kids. There are kids who um, really are having a very hard time. But those calls were just as much about the parents. And, you know, I've heard so many times self-care, right? How many times for everybody out there have you heard, take care of yourself, self-care. And, and most moms can't even decide what self-care is besides like screaming in the bathroom or something. So, you know, there are things you can do to take care of yourself. Um, and they will come and go in effectiveness. But look, this is not the very first time you've had challenge in your life. It's not the first time if you're grown up. And so you have a toolkit um, that you have used before in your life that got, got you through hard times. And this is the time to go sit somewhere in a corner and think about what's in your particular toolkit. And also, what you might add to it. So I had a funny experience today with you, Anita. If, if you asked me what's in my toolkit, I would say writing. You know, when my dad died when I was young, I wrote. That's when I started writing. So I would have said my toolkit is helping in writing. But Anita and I had a discussion today, and I was talking about being a little overwhelmed because even shrinks are overwhelmed and heads of organizations are overwhelmed. And Anita was great. She was like, okay, so the structure is we're going to start at this time and we're going to have these questions. And I felt so relieved. And I forgot that structure is something that belongs in my toolkit. So you need to do that. You need to think what you've used before and what, what's comfortable for you now. And for some of you, it may be structure, like it was for me. Um, and for some of you, it might be lack of structure. But it's not the first time you've been confronted with challenge, figure out what you've used before, stay close with your friends, um, make sure your kids are still socially connected. Um, and some kids, by the way, for those, those of you who have kids who are really doing well, because there is a group of kids that are doing well, because they say things like, nobody called me fat today. I love not going to school. I don't get bullied. So there are some kids who are doing perfectly well and some families who are doing perfectly well. But I think whatever cracks you had before, whether in your relationship with your spouse or with your kids, those cracks have the potential to become chasms. And that's what you want to stay away from. You want, you, that's why I don't want to argue with that girl who mom has argued with a million times before about getting up on time. Um, you don't want to turn those in, into irreparable ruptures. It's not worth it. So you ignore what's annoying about your husband or your wife or your kid and, and kind of get on with it and have some fun. Try, I, you know, nobody ever talks about fun in this situation. The highlight of my week is I go out walking with Kathy Fields and my friend Wendy and we have a good time and it, and, really try and find something in your family, a game, a goofy thing, something stupid, hide and go see, where you have a little bit of fun in this. Um, yeah. I think that's, a, that's, that's very good advice. I think uh, sometimes parents are looking for ways to mitigate stress on their kids, and you mentioned that. Are there any proven approaches that we should be thinking about that would mitigate a, a, a destructive stress? There is no way for children to not know what's happening in the world and you need to recognize that and talk to them about it because oftentimes they'll assume it's a lot worse than it actually is if you don't talk about it. But uh, what should parents be thinking about in terms of mitigating stress? So foundationally, we know called the four S's, right? It's, it's safe, it's uh, stable, it's soothing, and it is, what's the fourth one? Soothing and seen. This is like the foundation of a relationship with your kids. Safe, I'm sorry, safe, secure, seen, and soothed. That's your job. Write those four things, stick it on your refrigerator or something like that. It is not about making sure your kid gets A's or uh, what's going to happen afterwards or how popular they are. None of that. That's, that's all icing on the cake. In order for kids to be okay, and 
really what we want now is okayness, not excellence, because that's very iffy. You want everybody to be okay. You have to have a, a secure, safe place where kids can be and feel seen, which means listening. What, how do you feel seen? You feel seen if somebody is just listening to you. We just don't do a good enough job on that. And then soothe those, you know, you can't go out and hug people anymore. You can hug your kids, you can hug yourself. Um, and that's, I think that's the foundation that people need to keep in mind. And then, you know, the things you've heard a million times, um, kids, what mitigates stress? Uh, a good night's sleep, exercise, you know, we've known as psychologists, as doctors for a million years that exercise is profoundly important in, in attenuating and lessening depression and anxiety and all kinds of stuff. So make sure your kids get exercise, make sure they get some sleep, um, make sure they eat well, make sure they have breaks. Don't expect kids to sit for three hours at a time, maybe 45 minutes at a time, depends on your kid's tolerance. And the other thing I think is critical, absolutely critical, is um, a sense of purpose, right? Your kids are home, you have time to have conversations about what this means and who's suffering and who's suffering more and less. And I think it's time to think about what you and your family would like the world to look like afterwards and would like your family to look like differently afterwards. And, and infusing a healthy dose of tikkun olam, of purpose, what is the purpose that you're attached to, whether it's helping Jewish Family and Children's Service with phone calls or distributing food, but you know, you take away that sense of purpose and, and people really do fall into depression. So I think that's important. I think that's really important. And you know, that gets to the role of parents in all, all this, because what I've seen all these years at Jewish Family and Children's Services is that uh, people think they're looking for happiness, but they're actually not looking for happiness They're looking for meaning. Right. And happiness is a byproduct of finding meaning. But if you want your kids to have a sense of purpose, uh, what I've seen is that let them see you as a parent sacrifice for something you really believe in. Let them see you work hard for a cause uh, that you really believe in. That does more than anything you could ever do to give a child a sense of purpose and meaning. But then it goes a little bit too far sometimes, and, and no one has written more about this than you have. Uh, you know, every family has different issues going on. Right now, a lot of people are facing unemployment and economic issues, but still there's this underlying sense of, I don't want my child to fall behind. All the other mm -hmm. kids are doing really well. They're all gonna go to great schools. You know, uh, there's anxiety about what success is. And um, could you comment on that a little bit? Because a lot of people <laughs> ask oftentimes, this is your area, but a lot of people ask oftentimes, you expect me to not put pressure on my kid and even they're sitting home now, so that's even worse because they're going to fall behind. Right. Uh, and then all the other kids and all the other parents are really, uh, you know, pushing hard to get to Harvard. And 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 what should I do? Right. So um, I've been talking about this for fifteen years, along with a whole bunch of other people. And um, you know, your your kids grown. My three sons are grown. Uh, for anybody who's listening to this, I can guarantee you that when you're, I have three millennial sons, when your kids are grown up, the grade they got in junior high school in social studies will be meaningless to you. You want your kid to be kind, you want your kid to be uh, compassionate, you want your kid to be a good citizen, a good spouse, a good parent, you know, we have this incredibly short-term view of raising children, as if raising children is um, uh, snapshots. Like right now, my kid didn't get into their first choice school and it's the end of the world, right? But you and I know that it's really a movie and the movie goes through all these little snapshots to greater or lesser degrees of importance. But at the end of the movie, let's say when your kid's 35, um, what you want is a compassionate and kind and caring person who's in a good relationship. Um, I, I'm a brand new grandma who's a good parent. Um, and 
you know, when the, when the pandemic first started at Challenge Success, we didn't get any questions anymore about, you know, how's my kid going to get into their top school? Um, and we're starting to get them again, which troubles me. It is, uh, there is not one school, who knows what school's gonna look like anyway in September. And I think a lot of kids are having the experience that they can learn in a variety of modalities. And uh, look at what happened with uh, the Varsity Blues scandal. Um, you, you, you set a miserable model if you uh, believe that your child's chance of success really depends on any one thing. And I, I told the story of this kid who's taking calculus and his father is so anxious about it that his father is graphing every single grade he gets. Kids taking calculus, he's in high school, it's an advanced math class. You would think the father could at least let him graph his own, but he's not. And it's just a huge, huge vote of no confidence. The kid has trichotillomania, he's pulling out his hair and his eyelashes. Um, but dad's concern is not that, his concern is straight A's. And it's, it's very misplaced if you're somebody who works with kids who, at the end of a story like that, really don't function well out in the world. So what, what's, your, what's your advice to parents then about uh, how to raise children to have the right values about what success is? So, um, you know, you get, you get to be a little bit of an actor if you're a therapist. And when I have kids come in who think they're going to impress me with a grade or whatever, I'm bored. You know, I'm just looking out the window, looking at my watch. I'm not, I don't want to put a lot of energy into that. I want to put a lot of energy into the things that I think matter. So when that same kid at some point comes in with something that they're genuinely interested in, or an act of friendship or an act of giving, then I light up. And when I light up, they light up because kids take all their cute, no matter how much your daughter is rolling her eyes or your son is slamming his door at this stage, you are the most important person in your kid's life. And what's so hard now for teenagers and young adults is you are the most important person, but they're hardwired to be with their friends, not with you. So having broken that um, really biological requirement, they're, they're having an awfully hard time. But to go, to go back to answering your question, I think you pay attention. First, you model it yourself, right? You, you, you know, we, we all think talking to our kids is so important. And it, you know, it is. Listening to our kids is more important. And having our kids watch what we do without a lot of um, look at me. You know, the families where it's all like, look at me. When we used to do mitzvah day, um, there were families who were like, look at me. And then there were families who were just doing the work. And I think your kid is watching not just what you do, but your attitude towards what you do. And so when your kid comes in and did something and is so all about themselves, that's not the point of it. The point of it is to be a good person and um, to try repairing the world without it being all about you. So I think, I think a lot of parents actually do the right thing, Anita, but they, make, they, they, they do it wrong in terms of how they frame it. Um, I think you need to frame it as this is just what people do in yeah, a community. I think that's right. I think that's right. But right now, especially given the circumstances, parents are feeling quite inadequate. They're just not sure like what's okay, what's not okay. And they're also not sure, uh, and, and I'm getting this a lot uh, in, in the, at the Center for Children and Youth, the understanding when a problem is like, is a serious clinical problem and when it's just normal behavior like uh like a, like a child who uh you mentioned you know wants to sleep late but what if they do that like every day what if they, they don't they're not getting out of bed like at what point do you have to start to be worried about anxiety or depression that that requires um, a, you know serious intervention okay so um you know the diagnostically it is about intensity and time so if your kid doesn't get out of bed one day, um, doesn't mean much of anything except it was a bad day. If your kid doesn't get out of bed for two weeks, uh, you need to talk to somebody. So, you know, we use two weeks as a 
marker for diagnosis. It, it, this time is unprecedented. We don't have best practices about diagnosis in a, in a pandemic and an economic collapse and all that kind of stuff. So I think you might be a little more cautious, but making sure that it's not your own anxiety that needs attention. So if your kid is teary all the time or most of the time over two weeks, if your kid won't get out of bed over two weeks, you're looking for hopelessness and helplessness as signs of serious depression. There's no reason, there's no point. Um, th those are all flags. And having trained the Jewish family and children's service, I can't recommend highly enough that if you're concerned about your child, talk to somebody about it. Talk to somebody who has seen not two children like you've seen, but a hundred children and is better positioned to help you figure out if it's really a problem or not. And we are, you know, we are, you said, what am I seeing? We are seeing regression to, I'm seeing regression to previous problems. So a kid, uh, today I spoke to a kid who I had treated for an anxiety disorder really successfully like six years ago. And all of a sudden they're anxious and all the kids with OCD who've been treated, uh, what, they're having a heck of a time because now everybody's supposed to wash their hands. So I think whatever the vulnerability was before, I think as a parent, this is one thing you can do, know what your kid's vulnerability is and your own vulnerability. And if you're gonna pay attention to anything, you know, pay attention to that. If you're, my vulnerability is anxiety, I know it. So I meditate and I do relaxation and I pray and, you know, you, you have to know what your vulnerability is and how you attend to that. Because that's what I'm seeing is kids backsliding into, and, and parents too, into problems that they really had mastered. So sometimes it's just a quick um, review for them of how they got over it and what they need to pull back into their lives to help them. Yeah, that's important, you know, but uh, a lot of parents are having a hard time figuring out how to, uh, you know, not only just take care of themselves and their own economic problems and their own issues, take care of their kid, but now all of a sudden the kids are home all the time. They have to also be teachers. Right. And now everybody's really concerned because what are they gonna do all summer? I mean, there's not gonna be camp and there's not gonna be school. Uh, parents are asking a lot of questions about you know, what kinds of, how, how should I approach my child's day? What should I do to try to help my child uh, fill their day in, in meaningful ways? Do you have any thoughts about what parents should be doing with their kids and how they should be thinking about it? I think they should call you <laughs> because you have a tremendous set of resources. It's a, it's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you need, if, if, most people have kids of different ages, so you need a clearinghouse of an organization that, ha you know, I could tell you something for a five-year-old, but I'm lost on a 10-year-old. So I think, I think I'd encourage people to check out the resources that you have available. I mean, we're all going to be using a lot of resources, so parents also have to be comfortable saying, I need help. I want to emphasize that for a minute, and then I, I, I'm going to take questions because we have a lot of questions from our audience, of course. Uh, one of the biggest problems on the issue of uh, when to seek help is that uh, people feel that asking for help somehow reflects an individual inadequacy, that something is weak with them, that they wouldn't be having to ask for help in, for themselves, about how they feel about themselves or their relationship or uh, problems with their child. Uh, and there's a lot of stigma attached to asking for help, when in fact, uh, one of the best things and the strongest things somebody can do is to ask for help, to get a, a sense of, is this a big problem? Is this not a big problem? What kind of resources are out there in the community? What should I be thinking about? You know, just call. Uh, you should call Jewish Family and Children's Services. We, I, as I mentioned, we'll give you the number. But uh, this is the hardest thing is to feel alone. Like, we don't want people to feel feel like they're alone. Uh, and uh, this is a time when a lot of people are feeling quite alone. Uh, and, and it's really a problem because as you mentioned, even before this pandemic, uh, the loneliness is uh, a uh, epidemic in this country. You, any age group you ask, 
whether it's elderly or it's adults or teenagers, they will say, uh, many of them, that they feel very alone. Now, of course, we really feel quite alone. So the effort of this community and of our work uh, together is to make sure that people know that there's a place to go if they need help. And if they have questions, they can get their questions answered and they think their child needs help or if they themselves need help, they should call. Uh, well, Anita, I just want to add a, a coda to that, and that's that um, in the best of all possible worlds, one of the things that happens out of this is the value of family and relationships gets emphasized when, when this is over, that um, people understand that it wasn't the stuff that they wanted, and it wasn't the college, and it wasn't the grades, that it was the family that got them through, that it was the community that you offered that got them through. And um, that would be a nice outcome. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think that, uh, you know, as, as is true with every crisis we've ever faced, uh, certainly in this country or in the world, whether it was the depression or World War II or uh, the Vietnam War or even, God forbid, the Holocaust, we ultimately, came out stronger as a result of that experience. And I think that will happen with this too. So these questions that we're grappling with are really important. I'm getting a lot of questions from our audience and I wanna share a few of them with you. It gets back to the issue, uh, many of the questions have to do with the issue of teenagers, which is always a, a challenge and it's one of your specialties. But uh, <laughs> some of the parents are asking, um, the teenagers put a lot of pressure on themselves. It's not just the parents or the schools that put pressure on them. So how, um, uh, how does a, a parent uh, help a child who's putting a lot of pressure on themselves uh, to, to, to be a little bit less anxious and to um, not take in the pressure that they see uh, among their peers? So one of the things that I find really worrisome is when I started all of this, it was all about the parents. And it was the parents pressuring the kids um, and I think in some ways, some of that has been solved. Now it's the kids pressuring themselves. And I ask that every time I go to a school, is it the parents or the kids? It's always both, but I never used to hear the kids. So the kids themselves now have internalized this as uh, what will catch their parents' attention, their community's attention, but also have them feel good about themselves. So. I, I think you have to um, stay, you have to be interested in the process as a parent and not so interested in the end result. You know, it's like my saying, if a kid comes in and is crowing about their A, that's kind of interesting, not particularly. What's much more interesting is the self-portrait she drew or the babysitting experience that she had. So I think parents' attention determines some of this. And, and I know that there are parents out there who are doing everything they can not to push their kids. I may have told you this before, and sometimes I'll go to a, a parent's house, a family's house and sit at the dinner table because the parents are like, I'm not pushing it, I'm not pushing it, it's all about my kid. And they're not, they're not saying to the kid, you gotta get an A, but they are saying at the dinner table, uh, did you see the Tesla that the neighbor just got? Or uh, so-and-so just got an internship at Goldman Sachs. It's what we attend to, both implicitly and explicitly. And I think we've got the explicit part, but not the implicit part. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's part of it. There are kids who are perfectionistic and they don't, I think the thing to bear in mind is whether or not there's a toll on the kid from that. There are some kids who can be that way and be fine. Mm -hmm. um, for many kids, they, the, the first thing we look for is a somatic problem. Do they have belly aches? Do they have headaches? Do they have migraines? Um, if your kid is perfectionistic, can't get a good night's sleep, is complaining of headaches, then, then that's a problem that needs intervention. Mm -hmm. But if it's not really quite at that level, you know, pay attention to the things you want to cultivate. What about uh, uh, drug and alcohol use? Do you see an increase in that with teenagers, especially? Um, not, not so much, actually. No. Um, the one thing, since I have an audience that I want to say about drug and alcohol use is for those of you who think it's a better idea to have the alcohol at the party at your house, 
there's very, very good research that says that kids who have substance abuse problems, not use, abuse problems, had tolerant parents about alcohol and drug use. So it's a, it's a fact worth knowing about. Yeah. That's a subject of a, a whole other conversation that, you know, having a country that has 5% of the world's population and uses 50% of the world's illegal drugs is uh, a sign that there's a big problem that uh, and we all have to grapple with that. Right. A lot of parents are writing to me right now about uh, a related issue. Uh, here's a question. We're struggling with the amount of time on screens outside of their classes mm -hmm. uh, because they aren't doing after school activities. Uh, they don't want to go outside. Should we just let it go and avoid all the conflicts around trying to limit it and maintain harmony? Or is this an important fight we should keep doing? This I probably is a recognizable uh, <laughs> among is. many parents. Yeah, it is. So um, uh, moderation would be your best uh, your best trail. Um, your kids should have exercise. Period. Exercise is good for a whole bunch of things like anxiety and depression and not gaining weight and stuff like that. Kids are going to be on screens more. Absolutely, they're going to be on screens more because, I said before, their social network is their lifeblood. So if your kid is on screens somewhat more than you would like, I'd leave it. If your kid will not get out of the house at all, I wouldn't leave it. And then you go back to what you used to do, which is you want to be on screens like that. You want another half hour, you got to go outside for a half hour. I mean, we don't have the... Uh, we don't have the leverage we used to have by saying I'm taking away the car keys. Um, so we have to figure out what leverage we do have. And again, you know, I would start that conversation by t tell me about it. You're not going out at all. Um, you know, that's good for you. Talk to me about it. And, you know, at the end, you can come in and say, I understand how you're feeling, but listen to what they have to say about it. And then, kick their butt out the door a couple times a week to make sure they're getting some exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All things in moderation. Especially. <laughs> Good. Right. Uh, I've been getting some questions also about um, how, what's the best way to help teenagers deal with danger. Danger? Danger, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dangerous behavior, risk-taking behavior. So that's really an interesting question because, again, teenage brains are wired for risk. Um, there's a great book by a guy named Steinberg on the teenage brain, which is worth reading if you don't understand what the heck is going on with your teenager. Um, but they're, they're wired to, to do risky things. Um, and that's because it gives them a shot of dopamine, which makes them feel better. So I think the parent's job really is to help kids learn how to assess risky behavior that is really dangerous to their health and risky behavior that that is tolerable. I think um, my my young son Jeremy was once invited to a uh, rock climbing camp and he has asthma and there was no hospital nearby and, but his asthma was under control and he had rescue medicine and it was a sophisticated group and I let him go because the risk seemed tolerable and it was a healthy experience for him. Um, he breathed fine. I didn't breathe the whole weekend he was gone, but it, that's part of being a parent is learning, is for us to learn how to tolerate the anxiety that comes along with letting a kid grow up. They will not always choose, make smart choices. You can be prepared for that, um, but they have to learn how to make smart choices. So instead of screaming and yelling when they do something wrong, you have to really go over the scenario with them and help them to understand why what they did was dangerous and how to avoid it the next time. But to think that kids are not going to do dangerous things is to misunderstand adolescence. I think that's important. I, I think uh, probably if you ask parents, what age group it's the most complicated and difficult to deal with and uh, not understand exactly how the brain is wired and right. set limits appropriately. Um, it's, it's the adolescent period and especially under these circumstances. So uh, 
Right, uh, and, and what, what do we find protective? We find adult um, oversight is protective. So they do these experiments where they put kids in a room and they have them drive as if they're driving a car. And if their parent is in there with them, they, they're fine, they drive, as, they drive fine. If you put one kid in there with them, they don't drive fine. So you have to decide, given what we know about the impact of peers on kids' behavior, you don't want your kid, well, it's not an issue now, but you don't want your kid going out with his, with his uh, learner's permit and four other people in the car. That's an unacceptable risk. Um, and so that's a discussion worth having about what you're going to tolerate, what consequences are, and, and what, what is not tolerable. You know, we've had some terrible, when I lived in Marin, some terrible tragedies there around kids driving in groups. So I think there are certain things to be more, is your kid ever going to drink? I can promise you, yes. Are they almost promise you? Are they ever going to try, you know, have some weed? Yeah, probably. Um, most kids actually have sexual experiences before they're out of high school. Um, you know, this stuff is, happens. You want to make sure it happens in a well, as well informed as you can way. That means talking about birth control. That means talking about drinking and driving um, and not making any assumptions that your kid knows better because they don't. You know, uh, the parenting issue is complicated enough. And again, under these circumstances, we have to also deal with um, some parents are raising issues about dealing with guilt. You know, dealing there's with a lot what? of privilege. Guilt, for example, that, you know, some families are really struggling and there's a lot of issues having to do with race that we have to also talk about. I mean, if you have, a, if you're African-American, you have to talk to your children about those issues, which is, uh, shapes their lives in very profound ways that most of us don't understand. We have to deal with guilt, for example, for some families who their biggest problem is not financial. Their biggest problem is the quarantine. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of parents have a lot of guilt about, uh, about the situation they find themselves in. And they know that some people's situations are worse. So I have some questions here about you know, how people should deal with their feelings about uh, feeling guilty. And that makes it harder for them to actually talk to their children. Feeling guilty about, can you, can you say a little about, bit more about, about that? Uh, about managing uh, this, uh, their own feelings about feeling like other people are, have a much worse situation than they oh, do. Yeah, What's yeah. the complaint about? You know, some people are really, you know, suffering. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their resources. They're managing, you know, hate and racism and, you know, really, really difficult situations. Right. So um, I was really disturbed today. They had... I think it was in the Times, a breakdown of what percentage of wealth billionaires had given to COVID and the Black Lives Matter. And it was, it was just, they translated it into what it would have been if you gave or I gave. They trans translated it into different incomes. And it was unbelievably pathetic from my point of view. And so I, I think I brought that up because, you know, you feel guilty, do something. If you're going to feel guilty, do something about it. Um, get, get involved with an organization. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm older. I don't have the tolerance anymore for, you know, oh, I feel so guilty. All right, you feel so guilty, go do something about it. The world is suffering, go do something about it. And I think, I think that the message to kids um, when they see their parents just kind of reiterating how guilty they are is that um, life is basically out of your control. And when you feel like life is out of your control, you're more prone to depression and substance abuse and all kinds of things. So to the extent to which you can add a little bit of control to your own life and to your kids' lives, by the way, it's not something I mentioned, but um, one of the things that's important to give kids now is some control over their lives because they have so little. So if they, I don't know, want to eat ice cream for breakfast, that's probably okay once in a while. Or they want to run around in their pajamas all day. That's probably okay. Everybody worries that that, that means they'll only eat ice cream for the rest of their life. Um, as somebody who has had ice cream every night of this pandemic, I expect that will stop when the pandemic is over. But uh, 
yeah, I don't, I don't think things escalate as badly as, as people think. And I think if your kid sees you just shrying over and over again about how it's out of control and you can't do anything, that's a lousy role model. You want a role model, you know, what's the piece of it that I can do? What is the piece of it that I can do? For some people, it's therapy. For some people, it's the Jewish community. For some people, it's the food bank, uh, the environment. I, I don't care, but you have to do something. <laughs> no, I think that's really important, and, and we need to wind up uh, pretty soon. I have one more question, and then we'll talk a little bit more about doing okay. something and about community. I don't want to leave out grandparents. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I have actually a couple questions from grandparents who are asking what, um, what could grandparents do to help parents and, um, and, their, and their grandchildren at this moment? Or maybe you should turn it around. What should grandparents not do is also, <laughs> is also part of the answer. So uh, right. any advice for, for, uh, for grandparents or how parents and kids should relate to their grandparents? So it's really hard for, for grandparents right now. Um, I called my son yesterday and I said, I don't, I'm coming over. I haven't seen my, my young granddaughter for three months, three and a half months. They live eight blocks away. Um, it's, it's a really hard time. You stay connected on Zoom and you stay connected on phone calls and on Facebook and whatever else, depending on the kid's age. Um, I think it's really important for grandparents to be supportive and not directive with their own children. Uh, their own children are struggling enough to try and get it right. I think the stance of, um, let me know if I can help you. I'm here, let me know. That's it. Um, they, the child of the grandparent needs to know their support there, not that they're doing it wrong, not that you know the grandparent would have done it differently. I think. You know, Anita, at the end of the day, I think this whole thing, as I think about life in general, is about relationships. And the worst thing you can do in a relationship is rupture it. And rupture it means you get into the psychological space of the person. You know, I knew you couldn't handle this. You know, you're always overindulging the kids. Those are ruptures. They're not disagreements. And I think that it's really important to stay away from those kinds of things so that the relationship stays intact. Those things are never helpful um, for a grandparent or a therapist or a friend to be doing. You want to let people know you're around, you're supportive, you value the relationship, um, and you're going to work to keep it going. You know, it's, you and I saw that same slide yesterday of the duck on top, you know, Ken's slide. Do you, want to, do you want to explain what that slide is so people yeah, know? What so that, uh, we, we talked with a man named Ken Ginsberg, who's a fabulous resource on resilience. And he had a slide of a duck uh, gl gliding on the surface. And then he shows you underneath, you know, a duck is going, working like crazy. And his point was, you do have to glide on the surface. But when your kids are a little bit older, you know, they have to know that it's hard work to glide along the surface, right? So everybody's doing the best that they can. I, nobody has called me saying anything crazy. They, they just haven't. They've called with, am I doing a good enough job? And the answer is always, the best you can do is a good enough job. Thank you, Madeline. Of Thank you so much. I mean, I, I think your understanding about relationships and about the importance of love in relationships and, and the strength that we get from each other is, uh, is so critical at this moment. I want to uh, just emphasize again the, the, the value of community. Now is a time when we need to know that we're not alone, that we have organizations uh, that are here for us. We have resources that are here for us that people should be asking for help and getting strength from each other and asking for help or for guidance or for support, uh, even for resources about what to do with your kids uh, if they're teenagers, uh, getting involved in service. I mean, what's been really remarkable for me uh, working at Jewish Family and Children's Services is during this situation, we have thousands of people who need help, elderly people who are alone, uh, you know, hundreds of people who need food in the community who never thought of themselves as people who needed food before, who are coming to all our food banks for food. Uh, 
you know, people who need loans, no interest loans or grants, uh, and, and they're all coming to the community and getting a source of strength. And this is what we stand for as a Jewish community. We serve everybody, but we want to demonstrate that when you're in trouble, you have a place to come and get help. And you also can volunteer. Mm -hmm. We've had, we have about two and a half thousand volunteers, over 500 of whom are mostly young people, millennials and, and even younger, who are volunteering to help at this moment. I mean, what could be more inspiring, more wonderful than that? What could represent what we stand for as a community more than that? Um, we're also working very closely with other communities, especially now interfaith communities with the African-American community, with the different faith communities, all as one community working together to move us in a better direction at a very difficult time. So get involved, call, ask for help, serve, that's what we need to do right now in order to find our way and, and, and give our children strength and model for our children what it means to, uh, to, to be happy and to find meaning in your life. So I hope uh, some of you will call us if you need any help um, or if you want resources or if you want to volunteer. Now is a time when we need each other more than everything else we could possibly do. We need to find community and value our relationships. So I wanna thank um, each of you for being on this call. Uh, this is the beginning of a, of a lot of conversations. I wanna thank you, Madeline, for being such a resource and such an inspiration to us. Uh, you are a true luminary in the field and your understanding about children and, and families is, uh, is very profound and a great source of inspiration to me. So thank you so much. I want to and thank uh, you and thank you, Anita, for what you have done. You know, I I doubt that people know that when you came in, Jewish Family and Children's Service was a little organization in a little building, and you have I I, I couldn't be more privileged to be working with you on these issues. Thank so, so thank you. Thank you so much. Now is a time when we need to emphasize love. We need to move this country in a better direction. We understand um, the damage that hate can do. As a Jewish community, uh, we understand what other communities are going through, especially right now in this, in this country. So we need to be in solidarity. Uh, and I just want to uh, uh, tell you that we're going to put a slide up right now. So take that number down. We're standing by for calls uh, tomorrow. Our staff are available to answer any calls you have. Uh, there's also information about the Ready or Not, Madeline's book. And uh, God bless each of you. May God give you strength. And may God bless your families. Thank you, everybody.